Welcome to Money Talks. I'm Genevieve Westcott with the latest financial updates from the country and the city here at home and around the world. Coming up, they've taken to the streets of London to protest Britain's austerity budget and the massive cuts to government services. Bill English warns our government's poised for some severe slashing and burning of spending here at home of what he calls the bloated public sector. The budget blues, what will it mean for Kiwis? Is the kitty running dry for Christchurch's business recovery? John Key says taxpayers can't top up the city's central business owners indefinitely. Is it crunch time in the quake zone? And is it the beginning of the end for our heavenly high wool prices? Hint, keep an eye on those climbing cotton prices. Globally, it seems change is afoot as consumers opt to buy food, not fashion. All this and much, much more coming up, starting as always with the global markets. And ASB role economist James Shortle joins us now. But before we talk about global markets, what's been going on with uh, the burgers in this country? Yeah, I knew you were going to bring this up, <laughs> Jennifer. I love food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's interesting. Uh, on the market, uh, the markets yesterday, we saw plenty of action for uh, for restaurant brands, and, and this is unusual to be honest. Um, they they had volume of about ten times what they usually do for a, for a day, and I was sort of looking at why that was the case, and the only thing I could put it down to was a double down burger and uh, you're probably under <laughs> wondering what the double down burger is but basically two big pieces of chicken with some cheese in the middle no no bread nothing so pretty basic stuff but plenty of protein wow okay well i'll be lining up how about you i'll see you at lunchtime that uh, sounds pretty good to me actually <laughs> there are a few people in the office that sounded pretty excited about the prospect too there you go is this what life has become for us okay let's go to the global markets uh, trading uh, more normally this week uh, what's behind that do you figure well, I think uh, we've started to see a little bit more um, sort of um, normalcy in the in the market uh, around the world, but there's still plenty of action going on, of course, in the Middle East, out of Japan. Um, but we're starting to see some of the, uh, the the factors out of Europe around the debt situation starting to reemerge. So to me, that means that uh, investors are perhaps going back to some of the more fundamental reasons um, why the markets are doing what they're doing and, and some of the some of the reasons behind that. So equity markets have actually been relatively good over the past week, and you know here in, in, in New Zealand, they've actually, actually seen ten straight days of gains. So um, you know, some quite quite positive factors out there. How's the Aussie dollar are doing these days? Well, it's ripping ripping in the head, to be honest. Um, you know, it went through uh, an all-time high the past couple of days, well over 103 against the US. Um, and to be honest, I think that's a, a good reason why um, the New Zealand dollar's been, been lifting. So we got down to around 71 and a half against the US sort of right after the after the Japanese situation and now we're all of a sudden up, up around 75 and a half. So um, I think a lot of that that increase um, has been off the back of the Australian dollar as well as some other factors. But um, if the Australian dollar is lifting, then it does, uh, we, we're dragged along, unfortunately. Let's talk farmers. Uh, beef prices continue to chug along very nicely, thank you. Yeah, I think, uh, well, here in New Zealand, beef prices are, are looking pretty good, so farmers seem to be pretty happy about, about that fact. Um, and that's, a, you know, probably a reflection of what's happening in the U.S. market, particularly, of course, that's our biggest market. Um, you know, US, U.S. beef prices have been really strong. They're all, basically at all-time highs at the moment, and I think the situation there is looking quite favourable for us over the next couple of years. Now, meantime, wool prices continue to uh, go up and up, but I see that cotton prices are headed for a big fall, or that's what they're picking on the global market. Yeah, well, I mean, plenty, plenty of people are picking a lot of things at the moment. <laughs> they don't always pay off, I guess, but, uh, you know, the uh, the cotton market is an interesting one because we have seen wool prices respond um, positively, um, and that's been, you know, probably a factor of what's been happening in the cotton market over the past 12 months. So the latest on the cotton market is that we're starting to, uh, the, the US Department of Agriculture, they provide a whole lot of forecasts um, on where things are going and, and they're picking that uh, US farmers with the prices where they are, basically all time highs, they're going to start uh, planting cotton, you know, left, right and centre. And, 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 that, and that could affect the corn and the soybean uh, crops, correct? That's right. And that, if that happens, then it's going to have impacts on livestock producers in the US. We're going to see high prices in those markets. So that could be quite positive for us, but, you know, not necessarily in the wool markets, but ha perhaps in the sheep and, and the beef sectors and the, and, the, and the dairy sectors because of the, the meat issues. But, you know, I think um, the, the fact that we're going to see further production out of cotton, um, you know, starting to see speculators and, and futures down the track, starting to pick that cotton prices are going to fall. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that affects um, more. Watch this space. Thanks, James. Coming up after the break, it's not just the UK on the warpath about the new austerity budgets. European leaders fear Portugal will follow Greece with a massive bailout. The fallout for the rest of Europe and us here.
And the world is very, very nervous about potential nuclear power disasters as we watch the nuclear crisis grow in Japan. The debate rages around the globe and is already taking a political toll. But first, answer this in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. How much will the reinsurance payments total from February's Christchurch quake? The answer when we return. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you, how much will the reinsurance payments total from February's Christchurch quake? The answer, double what was previously thought, $3.56 billion, up from $1.7 billion. Joining us now is Murray Weatherston, former chief economist for the Bank of New Zealand and now a financial advisor of Financial Focus, putting his more than 30 years experience analyzing economic and financial markets to work. Murray, you're going to work for us here today. What's happening sure. in Christchurch? Where are we at? Well, we, we really only just passed the five-week mark now. Um, if you're thinking of it in terms of a medical pa um, patient, we've probably stopped the bleeding and now people are going to have to figure out what they have to do to get back to um, you know, decent health. And you know, clearly there's you know, a lot of work to be done in Canterbury over the next, or Christchurch especially, over the next you know, probably 5, 10, even 15 years. Yeah, the government's now announced it's a special task force. They figure it's at least a five-year plan. Uh, James, uh, do you think that's fairly ambitious? Well, five years. I mean, five years, I guess, in context is, seems to be a long time. But really, it's going to take... I don't know, a year, a year and a half to ready to get things off the ground to actually start to break some ground on some new buildings. Um, and do we have the manpower on the ground to, to get that going? I mean, um, five years is probably a, a good way to get things started, but we're still going to be a well well beyond that point before we really get things moving, I'd say. And we're seeing a lot of anger now starting to bubble through uh, uh, with business people in particular claiming, as you say, they don't have the access and they're afraid they're not going to have the support from the government either. Let's face it, the government's pretty broke right now. I mean, as Key said, uh, we can't be dishing out uh, money uh, forever to businesses there. Uh, what do you think, Murray? Well, I mean, I, I'm not really sure it's the government's job to, you know, to bail out businesses. Um, I they will have some insurance cover, but I suspect the insurance you know, claims will be going on for years and years. Um, but, you know, I just really feel sorry for the people who both own and work for those small businesses because you know, large numbers of them I just don't think have got a job. I think lots of people aren't going to start up their business again. Um, and you know, I was speaking to a few people from Christchurch at the weekend and they're basically just shell-shocked by it all. Interestingly, over in Japan, not long before the giant quake they had there, uh, experts were saying, listen, uh, uh, Tokyo, for example, could be the next big place that's going to be hit, and too mm. much of the economy is focused in Tokyo. We've got to decentralize. Is Christchurch really the place to rebuild? The question's got to be asked. What do you think? <laughs> that's a tough question to ask. It is ask, a tough, to and not honest. an economic question, but you know, uh, I think there's going to be a crisis of confidence in, in that whole region, don't you? Uh, and that's going uh, to affect the economy. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and um, people won't want to rebuild where there's been liquid, you know, liquefaction. Um, again, it's going to come down for, for a lot of people. It's going to come down to what insurance arrangements have they actually got? I mean, just imagine if it was your house that was on a. You know, silty thing, it had been um, shift off its axis, it's cracks everywhere, um, you'd be really worried. And the, unfortunately, you and I can't do anything about that. It's, it's actually happened. It's, a, it's an act of God that's, or force majeure, as the insurers would say, that they can't do anything about. I'll tell you something else we can't do much about, it seems, is uh, uh, what we're going to find out uh, about what the budget will be in May. It ain't going to be good news, is it, James? No, I don't think so. I mean, we've had a lot of um, sort of shakeups, you know, over the past twelve months since the last budget, and and really we've had one, you know, one major earthquake at the end of last year, um, and now the you know the massive earthquake at the beginning of this of this year, and that's you know changed things around. At the same time, um, probably underlying all of these fundamentals is that the economy just hasn't taken off. We uh, probably twelve months ago we were assuming that the New Zealand economy was going to pick up and it was actually going to start to really make some strides and, and go from strength to strength. And that certainly hasn't happened. I think uh, the economy has really underperformed and, um, you know, 
and then you add on these other factors, it's going to underperform for a while yet. And here's the question. Has it under, underperformed uh, because of the quake, because of the global recession, or have the boys and girls at the top not done such a good job? Murray? Well, I don't think you can blame it on the quake. I mean, the, the quakes really only happened in you know, September, Boxing Day, and then February, so that you, you can't blame it on that. Uh, maybe th it was actually the forecast that we're all wrong. You know, maybe we weren't actually going to recover as from the global recession um, as the you know, the optimists had. I mean, one thing, you know, almost speaking as a former economist, I can say, I've never yet seen a forecast that didn't pick up at the end. You know, two to three years out, you know, it always picks up. And what actually happens is that the um, the pickup actually just gets delayed, and so instead of the pickup being last year it's going to be this year and if it doesn't happen this year it'll be the forecast will say it'll happen the following year although uh, bill english is saying it's going to be the biggest budget deficit ever yeah, 15 it, billion dollars perhaps yeah but that's not a thing to be proud about i mean no no of you know, we've gone from a position you know two or three years ago where we were running you know continual surpluses into you know quite a large deficit and you know, one, one of the things I don't think any government has actually faced is um, cutting back the inexorable um, forward movement of government spending. I mean, government well, spending they're talking now, about it now, Murray, no, aren't they? No, no, frankly, they're just speak, you know, talking about it at the edges. It's, you know, if they spend about $90 billion. Right? And so if you're talking about you know, $800 million, that's less than 1%. You know, what... what um, a lot of people, I think, would like to see is someone come in and say, actually, what we're going to do is we're going to take $10 billion out of government spending to get it back to some level uh, so that we can pay a reasonable level of taxes and still be OK. And really, really, the politicians are just, of all, of all sides, are just frittering around the edges, in my view. OK, and, and are we going to see the sorts of protests in the streets that we've seen in London, of all places? Uh, people going berserk and uh, smashing into the Ritz Hotel, for goodness sake. Uh, people there don't like the austerity cuts. They're stuck with it. Same thing's going to happen to us, isn't it? That's right. I mean, just like a business or an individual who borrows too much money, you know, the banker comes in and says, you know, pull your horns in, you've got to make some changes. Um, with governments, the same thing happens. When the markets say, hey, we're not going to lend you any more money and you need to, like the European countries, where they're having to get money off uh, their, um, you know, the out of the European package and money off the IMF, that comes with a price. And the price is normally get your economy back into better shape, which normally means cut government spending, increase taxes. And, you know, nobody likes to have their uh, snout cut off at the trough, so to speak. How is it going to affect the rural economy uh, over the next year or so, James, do you think? Well, I think something to consider is um, that a lot of farmers are going to be paying tax this year, and a lot of tax. Um, so there's going to be a bit more money coming into the coffers because, you know, dairy farmers, you know, perhaps uh, they've, 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 they're, they're, this is going to get their best payout ever. Um, some places are, are seeing good production. Um, and But most of them, you know, most importantly, I think, are paying off debt at the moment. So they are going to pay a lot of tax this year and that's going to go into the government. So that's, that's a positive in my, in my opinion. But, you know, looking further ahead, um, you know, there's not going to be a huge amount, um, you know, there's going to be some benefits to, uh, to, to, to the rural economy and there's, uh, I think the real, the real pain is going to come probably for, for households, for, for um, you know, it's working for families, there's already been those indications. So, um, you know, the effects on, on rural New Zealand May not, be, may not be severe too, too much yet. It'll be the rest of us that will uh, bear the brunt of the pain. Speaking of pain, we go over to Portugal. They're mm. insisting, uh, I see their prime minister has had to resign, uh, 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 insisting all the way that uh, we have our dignity. We will not beg the European Union or the IMF, the mm. International Monetary Fund, for money. But it looks like they're headed for a massive bailout. What's happening with the pigs, Murray? Well, um, the, the pigs being Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece and Spain. Uh, Greece is already into the fund for 100 billion euros. Ireland's been in also for you know, the thick end of 100 billion euros. It looks like Portugal needs to go in for 100 billion euros. They've got government debt equivalent to about three quarters of their gross domestic product. They've got unemployment running at 10%. Uh, the Prime Minister resigned, I believe, because he couldn't convince his minority partners uh, to actually go along with some austerity measures. You know, Correct. Por Port Portugal's really in... Um, uh, you know, debt problems. Uh, their banks have been downgraded. The country will possibly be downgraded. They've got five billion euros, you know, due to be repaid in the next month or so. Got another five billion needs to be repaid three months after that. You know, they're going to have their hand out, or they're, they're going to have to have their hand out for the hundred billion package to sort of buy some time 
to get some structural reforms in place. And it's not just Portugal they're worried about, as I understand it. It's the ripple effect. They're really worried about Spain, which has a much larger economy. James? Yeah, well, we talk about, you know, Murray's talked about the pigs. Um, you know, the, you know the, the, I think Spain's a biggie here um, because, you know, their, their bailout is, you know, and their GDP is, is bigger than, you know, a lot of those economies all around that region. So if they get into trouble, then that's going to have severe impacts on the whole European Union and also on, you know, the, the stabilisation fund that has been set up and whether there's actually going to yeah. be enough cash in the coffers to, to put that through. So that's the real risk. And, you know, if investors start pulling back, which we have seen in some areas, then it's a ripple effect. And, you know, every time a ripple comes, then the EU have had to step in and try and sort out that ripple. And, um, you know, Portugal's its next ripple. It just depends. I'm going to have to step in and help out. It depends on where that, where that next ripple comes through. Yeah. So that's the risk. And as if that isn't bad enough, of course, the Japan situation, we still don't know just how bad those radiation leaks are. But it's also having its effects up politically in Germany, first of all. Uh, James, talk to me about that. Yeah, I think it's quite an interesting one. I've, I've actually spent quite a bit of time in uh, Baden-Württemberg uh, playing tennis. Um, so in the, south, in the south of Germany, very conservative area. I've actually got a... Um, during my time playing tennis there, then uh, I've got a guy that's staying with me now. I helped his family out, so he's he's um, he's coming. He's down here staying with myself, and my wife. Um, so I was talking to him this morning, and he, he was shocked that the Greens have taken over. Um, you know, this is having you know the factors that are happening around the world are having big political um, effects. You know, we've got the nuclear power situation, um, austerity measures. All of these things are having really you know massive political tensions around the world. The Greens in power um, in Baden-Württemberg in Germany. That's um, not good news for. Uh, you know, for the, for the German Prime Minister and, and for her power, I guess. Um, but it's interesting to note that these things are all are all happening around the world. Because, of course, Germany's been big on nuclear reactors, and uh, initially she said that uh, they were just going to carry on. And then when Japan happened, she said, oh, I've changed my mind. We're going to get rid of the seven oldest reactors. Uh, this, is, uh, this is being felt by all of us, isn't That's right. it? Yeah, I think everybody who's against nuclear power takes what's happened to Japan to be the reason why nobody should you know, build any more nuclear power. And in New Zealand, where we've got alternative sources of energy, well, we you know, certainly historically we have, we've not needed really to confront that issue. But in Japan, you know, where they have import 80% of their oil and all other sorts of things, you know, they've needed nuclear power. Without nuclear power, Japan wouldn't be where it is today. And it's just one of these things that everybody who's again who's anti nuclear well just takes us an example of you know why you shouldn't have it straight after Japan saw uranium prices tumble um, seeing China also step in and said you know they're going to put on hold all of their um, nuclear new yes. nuclear uh, power power plants so this has big ripple effects energy is important so it's interesting to see how it goes okay watch this space as ever thanks gentlemen coming up after the break future proof what our experts will be keeping track of over the next seven days. Buckle up for the ride as we let her rip. But first, a question for you in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. What percentage of all European Union electricity is provided by its 147 nuclear reactors? The answer when we come back. Stay with us. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you, what percentage of all European Union electricity is provided by its 147 nuclear reactors? The answer, 30% of Europe's power comes from nuclear plants. And now it's time for Future Proof. What's coming up that our experts will be watching? James, how about you? Well, I think um, one of the important ones is probably you know, when it's, we've seen a lot of action out of Europe. Um, you've got this, uh, Irish banks have been stress testing, or the Irish have been stress testing their banks again. So the result's going to be out on Thursday. It's going to be in interesting to see how they come out of it. Um, you know, any ill effects are going to be noticed around the world. Uh, the Europeans, of course, are also talking about Portugal and what that impact they, that may have. Um, so there's a lot of um, uh, action happening in Europe at the moment and uh, it'll be interesting to see how that impacts, um, I guess, around the world. Murray, what do you think the Irish stress test, take two, round two, are going to show us? Well, I think um, the central bank has a wish that it'll come out and say, hey, things aren't as bad as what they are. I think they'll be looking to say, yeah, there might still be some problems, but you know, we've got the worst is beyond us. Because the whole thing, the banking industry survives on confidence. 
and if the banks were seen to be, you know, totally unsafe, all hell would break loose, frankly. So what are the lessons here at home that we should be taking from the Irish experience? Well, our, our banks here um, don't seem to be in any trouble whatsoever. They have um, seem to have missed the worst of the securitisation problems that affected everybody else. We, we don't have a lot of money lent into the Europeans. Um, and so, you know, I think our banks are four or five of the top ten banks by credit rating in the world. So, you know, for either by good luck or good management, um, we've actually averted most of the problems that have happened in America and in Europe. If only we didn't have to deal with that big budget deficit blowout. That's right. <laughs> that's right. It's going to cause some issues and, and um, that's going to be probably quite key for our economy over the next couple of years. I mean, we've already started to see, um, you know, that that's the start date of getting back to the surplus, um, getting further and further sure. ahead, uh, further and further away. away. So, um, you know, I think it's going to be quite critical over the next few years to see how things change and, of course, throw in the earthquake and that's uh, a major curveball for the government to get ahead right. of I mean, there's only two ways you can cut a budget deficit. You've either got to increase taxes, which either means you increase tax rates or you get a good growth rate in the economy, which will drive up tax revenues ordinarily, or you reduce expenditure. Neither of, neither of those are simple and there's losers in every case. Um, and, you know, over the next two or three weeks, it'll actually be interesting watching what I'd call the controlled leaks that will occur out of the beehive, which will be, you know, foreshadowing the sorts of things that are going to be in the budget, because the way they manage it, the, the actual announcement of the budget is usually a damp squib because everything... Is, yeah, actually you know being, already. You know already. And so I think, you know, over the next week or two or three, there'll be gradually drip feeding of, you know, policies of what they're thinking about cutting, what they're thinking about doing to raise income. If they were talking to you, Murray, what advice would you give them? Well, I actually think they need to take a knife to government expenditure. You know, it, and but where? What government expenditure? Uh, probably the, the amount that they're going to have to take out, they're going to have to take a bit off everything. Right. And so there's something like $20 billion worth of spending on personnel, and that's before you take the consultants and one into account. There's something over $20 billion spent on social welfare. Um, perhaps, you know, we need to have a fundamental discussion of how much of our resources can the government actually take. And it you know, may be that we're pretty close to, you know, the maximum. And if you're doing that, you, you don't do it by cutting $5 million here and $5 million there. You know, you've got to pick a big number, you know, be controversial, you know, five or ten billion dollars has got to come off spending um, to get us back to somewhere that's sustainable. On a slightly brighter note, you'll be watching some tennis, I understand. Tell us about that. Yeah, I think uh, an interesting one this week that I'm going to be watching, um, Novak Djokovic, he's on a 20-game uh, winning streak and he's just come off the Australian Open, of course, um, in January, and then he's uh, he just won the, the tournament in Indian Wells. Um, last week and this week he's playing in Miami, so um, he's looking pretty hot. I'm going to be uh, pretty inter interested to see how he performs this now, week. Now, you've played tennis yourself. Tell the folks at home <laughs> your, your checkered background. Oh, I'm pretty modest. So I probably won't divulge too much, but yes, I, um, I played professional tennis for a couple of years, played Davis Cup for New Zealand, um, past New Zealand champion. Uh, I spent... Uh, four years in, in the US on a, on a tennis scholarship um, in the, at the University of Mississippi. So uh, very lucky to have all of those opportunities. Um, still um, still playing tennis now and uh, you know it's a good way for me to stay fit and, but you know, still try to compete as best I can. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Thanks to my guests, ASP Rural Economist James Shortle and Murray Weatherston, Financial Advisor of Financial Focus. We love to hear your feedback, so drop me a line on the website. And for James and all you other tennis fans out there, a famous flashback, the year 2005. The contestants, Roger Federer and Leighton Hewitt at the Pacific Life Open. Prepare to witness the longest tennis point ever played. Just for fun, count the shots. Leighton Hewitt and Roger Federer fight out one of the classic rallies of the modern era. <laughs> Are you counting?
that's staying power, 45 shots in all. Keep the faith. See you next time.